would just like to give a very big thank you to my tier 5 channel members and patrons. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, Estrella the Dreamer, Mesic, Feudic Joel, German Chemist, and Casper Amholtz. Thank you again very much. Story number one. The Peacemaker, written by the Breadmaster. The tensions were already very high in the galactic community by the time the Terrans, or humans as they would prefer, joined in on the stars. Anyone could see that war was imminent between the two main factions, the Supreme Entente and the Altair Concord. The Supreme Entente were a group of royalists out of preferred monarchs and emperors, with strict societies and cultures. The Altair Concord, named after their founders, were more democratic, with elections and more freedoms in trade, tradition, and in life in general. Other, smaller groups existed, but mainly tried to avoid conflict, and usually ended up entering one of the two superpower groups due to the sheer power difference. The day the Terrans would join the galaxy was feared, as they were rather unusual. They had many, many factions amongst them, and had one of the highest populations recorded for a species. Their history showed that they could function under both forms of ruling, but have recently favored a more democratic bureaucracy. Naturally, the Concord wanted to bring them and strengthen their ranks, while the Intente wanted to keep them away, at least until they started favoring a more sovereign style of ruling. Some on both sides wanted them to be left alone until they could figure themselves out. Humanity, on the other hand, really didn't care what the others wanted to do and rapidly developed FTL engines once a few accidents revealed that alien life existed to the Terrans. Soon, the Terrans would discover the galactic community, and no one could do anything to stop it. The highly anticipated day of contact was near, and both sides rapidly started preparing for it. They did end up agreeing to not forcing them to pick a side for 25 galactic standard large cycles, or about 30 years. When they arrived, they immediately tried to learn about everything that they had missed. In the first month, they had a linguistic experts learn their languages, engineers learning about new advanced technologies, astronomers charting the universe, and merchants learning all of the trade routes. Within the first year, they had already integrated the galactic common in their way of life, and were teaching it in schools. In the fifth year, they had managed to make a non-verbal one with a mixture of hand signals, movements, blinking, etc. It had something for everyone, ensuring everyone could effectively communicate. Terrans also devised a way to make Dyson spheres and Dyson swarms, revolutionizing energy as a whole. They also massively developed the weapons field, turning kinetic weapons, something most thought to be useless and unredeemable, into a group rivaling the most advanced plasma and sonic weaponry. By the time the off-limits agreement ended, they had revolutionized the galactic community, in many ways not thought possible. Now, of course, neither the Concord or the Intente were actually idle in this time period. They both tried subtly and openly to convince the Terrans to join their group. The Concord painted the Intente as dictators and tyrants, something the Terrans tended to hate. The Intente depicted the Concord as a messy bunch who couldn't ever get anything done due to bureaucracy and corruption. Resources, technology, and territory was given to try and ensure loyalty. Both sides placed spies around, both to see what the Terrans were doing to help them and the enemy to sabotage their aid. Both sides had spent much of their resources due to how important this ally could be in the coming war. On the faithful day, the president of the highest-ranking ambassadors of the Concord and a few of the royal monarchs themselves traveled to the Terrans' homeworld to convince them to join their alliance. It was clear whoever they joined would be the victors in the coming conflict. However, the Terrans surprised both of them and ended up allying with a group of other mammals, simply known as the Bond of Development. So he focused on progress and trade, while angering both of them, as they had spent so much battering them up. The Concord actually preferred this, as the Bond was more democratically oriented. 
the Andante took this as a grave insult and took to eradicating them as soon as possible, mobilizing a great fleet. They expected to carry this fleet all the way to the conquering of Concord, so they poured everything they had into it. However, they weren't the only one with spies. The Terrans found out and started secretly making a military to fight them. They also informed the Concord and officially agreed to be allies in the coming conflict. As the war began, both sides started taking large amounts of casualties. The Intente weren't going for just beating them into submission, but instead were trying to eradicate them. They used weapons and tactics that violated galactic treaties, but it didn't matter to them. After all, all is fair in love and war, right? Humanity was understandably pissed, and the Intente expected a vengeance in the Terrans. But surprisingly, they continued on as normal, taking prisoners and treating the wounded, not causing unnecessary pain. However, Intente spines had found out about the top secret project only known as the Peacemaker. However, they couldn't find any other details. The Intente reasoned that this had two possibilities. A charity organization that would focus on stabilizing less while all planets to gather support, or a psychological weapon to make enemies lose their will to fight. To counter this, they decided to spread out troops into territories that needed the aid the most, and ensured their loyalty. They also trained their soldiers to resist psychological manipulation, and to keep fighting under it. However, the Agshaw project surprised everyone. The Intente prepared for the assault on their vital resource worlds, and thought that they were ready when the Terran fleet approached. What they saw astounded them. It was the biggest ship in recorded history, spanning for many miles, capable of holding a small species' entire population. That alone was impressive, but what was truly extraordinary was a giant railgun mounted to the top, easily the biggest weapon made in history. It was surrounded by several ships contributing to a massive shield, protecting it from kinetic, plasma, and nuclear weaponry. First, it shot a nuclear bomb for a round and instantly destroyed the vanguard of the Intente's forces. It fired again and again, and soon the entire fleet was destroyed. Then, it shot a projectile of pure dense metal at the speed of light at the planet, ending all life there immediately, then cracking it to its core. It did this again and again, wiping out most of the Intente military presence. Then, it turned its sights on the core world. As soon as it arrived, we braced for the end. But it never came. They sent terms of surrender, which surprisingly included aid to restabilize, returning of prisoners, and even allowing the Intente to continue its monarchy form of government, as long as the citizens' quality of life was improved. We accepted hastily, as to avoid the imminent annihilation. Soon after, the Intende disbanded, forming smaller groups with previous members, making the Concord the only superpower left. Humanity opted to join the Bond again, turn the Peacekeeper into colonizing ship, and generally try to forget the massacre committed. Many large cycles later, we finally found out why they called the Machine of War the Peacekeeper. After all, aren't they the complete opposite? We asked an admiral why the odd name, and he told us, It seems ironic at first, doesn't it? The way I see it is if there aren't anyone to fight, then there can't be a war. End of story. Story number two. They begin with the impossible, written by Lords of Jupe. Asymmetrical warfare is a difficult, nuanced thing and species who master it quickly become adept at seizing opportunities, or if needed, creating them. Battles cease being protracted, expensive affairs, and turn into lopsided masses of casualty reports for one side and a line item bidding matter for the other. For a little expense, a small number of combatants die for their cause. In exchange, morale is gained, or territories reclaimed, or assets change hands. The inverse, often deeply multiplied, is applied to the loser of the arrangement. 
losing a vast amount of fighters, materials, and territory, having a deeply profound effect on the standing military's morale. To that end, I will introduce myself. My name is Captain Jack C. Marshall, Terran Navy, and I'm about to run the stolen agricultural station through your vessel, which, I am freely admitting, has a beautiful name, the Siren of the Sun. It's poetic. Our understanding of your race and perspective cultures did not reflect that you can convey such strength and courage with a simple ship main. Not, of course, that your ship is a simple one, another mark in your favor. After all, you're driving a ship approximately one-third the size of our homeworld single moon, and frankly, that's impressive stuff. Filled with your factories, shipyards, and munitions development plants, it's basically a mobile war creation zone. It's damned impressive, and you should be proud as you can be, because it is an outstanding achievement. That you can do all of this with just a skeleton crew of 4,000 is nothing shy of astounding. Hats off to you, sincerely. Also, in about an hour, give or take, I'll be driving it myself, so uh, try not to muck up the command deck. You may want to have your flag officers visit whatever qualifies as a restroom facility very soon. The next bit of news, it may come as a bit of a shock. No, seriously. Pause this recording so that you cannot be attended to, because we don't have enough cleaning agents on hand. I'd appreciate the thoroughness. We're big on thoroughness over here, as you likely are learning. Probably, yes, because I did say I'm piloting an agricultural station, not a ship. I'll walk you through how this works in a moment, but suffice to say, yes, that's exactly what is happening and what I'm telling you to do. Go and do it, but with your time and mine. I'm presuming that you've released the pause function on this recording and obeyed that simple request. If so, I appreciate it. If not, familiarize yourself with the nearest janitorial station, because I will be taking it personally. Also, as an aside, we're transmitting our dietary codes to your ship, so that your culinary printers can get acquainted with our meal plans. We tend to eat heavy when on a roll through a new ship. Around six months ago, on your calendar at least, one of your vessels, the gloriously named Song of Gravity, intentionally fired upon a rescue and relief ship of ours, the Starpug. Starpug was, in part, a training ship, which meant we lost teachers and students and a few dozen patients, and we took that personally. Now, when we seized control of the Song of Gravity, all we intended to do was strip it for parts, execute the command crew, and strand the survivors on a nearby life-supporting planet. Basically, pretty civilized treatment, considering what had just happened. Instead, what we got was further antagonizing from your local colony of LV-90A, which you awfully declared as the Green Aura, which is kind of cool, as names go. Just a little on the nose when we found out it supplies a lot of your fleet with the food and beverages. Needless to say, we defeated the Harriers dispatched from the Green Aura, chased the survivors home, and decided, you know what, we could use a good meal, and maybe a drink or two. Which is why we attached all of the booster pods, acceleration units, and the six surviving jump and hurl drives to the hull of this magnificent vessel, Bounty of the Green. That vessel, the one I am currently piloting by the way, is getting really close to you now. Now, we're not done explaining what it is about to happen. As a reply to the loss of Green Aura, you sent those nasty threats to our homeworld and included a virus in the transmission which crippled our core computerized infrastructure and took it offline for what we estimate is going to be a decade. You knew that it would starve our people to death. We'd struggle, fight amongst ourselves and dwindling resources, and lose hope. Well, Chuckles, allow me to retort. We have a dozen ships which can empty our own planet in under a week, which, uh, by the way, you used to own, and they used to be troop carriers. Those troops, as a side note, are now a fascinating cluster of floating in our contrail, being dragged behind this vessel as I continue my approach at speed. 
We have successfully invaded your green aura, claimed it for ourselves, and settled in for the long haul. You wanted a fight, so congratulations. You picked one and was an undisputed master of asymmetrical warfare. We are not only about to kick your ass, but we're going to do it on time, under budget, and with a smile. Because this ship is not going to stop and trade shots with you when we arrive. We plan to continue our FTL flight plan directly through you. Fire off every life pod your race left for the station and use the jump hurl drives inside of the system. The calculations for doing this without slaughtering ourselves in the attempt are just mind-bogglingly complex. Seriously, it's a lot. See, we're also math geniuses uh, if we're motivated. And we're motivated. Picture, if you will, uh, 6,596 life pods, all with short-range capabilities of moving from point A to point B without generating momentum, and indeed capable of cancelling it during the jump as they fuse into your hull wherever they can possibly fit. Then the doors will open, and out each life pod will pour about a dozen or so Terran marines, and you can reasonably expect that they will be violently ill, followed by just being violent. We're going to lose some marines, which is okay, as they're all volunteer service branch. They are going to be problematic, and soon. What you need to worry about on a personal level is we scary feckers in the Terran Navy. I was born to beat you. See you soon, Chuckles. USN Smirking Revenge, out. Ben of Story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you